Mathematics is constructed from other math, which is constructed from other math, and so on. But what happens at the bottom? What grounds all of mathematics? Or is it just turtles all the way down? Mathematics is cumulative. It builds on itself. That's part of why you take math courses in a fairly prescribed order. To learn about matrices, big blocks of numbers, and the procedure for multiplying matrices, you need to know about numbers. Matrices are defined in terms of, in other words, constructed from, more fundamental objects, numbers. For this reason, it's not uncommon for people to view mathematics as a giant pyramid, with objects and concepts constructed from things below them. Let's pick, as a concrete example, four different types of numbers. Real numbers, rational numbers, integers, and natural numbers. Remember that the natural numbers are all the counting numbers, usually taken to include zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Building up the pyramid from the natural numbers, we can define the integers as being the result of subtracting natural numbers. They're all the possible things you can get by subtracting one natural number from another. So three is an integer because it's three minus zero, and negative three is an integer because it's zero minus three. More precisely, we can define each integer as an equivalence class, or a particular collection, of pairs of natural numbers. For example, the integer 3 is the collection 3, 0, 4, 1, 103, 100, and so on. And the integer negative 3 is the collection 0, 3, 1, 4, 100, 103, and so on. Under this definition, the integers also inherit their structure and properties from the natural numbers. For example, the integer associated with xy is less than or equal to the integer associated with zw if x plus w is less than or equal to z plus y. The order on the integers is defined using the order on the natural numbers. And the integer associated with xy plus the integer associated with zw is equal to the integer associated with x plus z comma y plus w. Integer addition is defined using natural number addition. You should check that the structure aligns with your intuition about the integers. We've constructed the integers using the natural numbers. And then from the integers, we can build the rational numbers. They're all the possible things you can get by dividing one integer by another, like 1 half, 7 over 512, or negative 3 divided by 1. And similar to the previous construction of the integers, we can define the properties of the rational numbers in terms of the properties of the integers. One step further, we can also construct the real numbers from the rationals. But it's a bit more tricky, using something called a Dedekind cut. A Dedekind cut splits the rational numbers into two sets. One set is made up of all the rational numbers below the cut, and the other set is made up of all the rational numbers above or at the cut. Let's make the cut here. All the rational numbers less than three are in one set, and all the rational numbers greater than or equal to three are in another set. This cut, or way of splitting the rationals, is identified with the smallest rational number in the upper set, which is three. The cut defines the real number three. Notice that the lower set doesn't have a biggest element. There is no rational number immediately below three. For any rational number below three, for example, 2.9, there will always be another rational number between that and three, like 2.95. Let's define a new cut. The lower set is all the rational numbers x, such that x squared is less than two, and the upper set is all the rational numbers y, such that y squared is greater than or equal to two. In this case, there is no smallest element in the upper set. It would be the square root of two, but that's not rational. This Dedekind cut defines the number square root of two. This particular way to split the rational numbers can be thought of as the definition of the real number square root of two. The real numbers are defined as all the possible ways to cut or split the rational numbers. The cut is identified with either the smallest element in the upper set, if one exists, like three, and otherwise, it's the gap between the two sets, like the square root of two. Starting with the natural numbers, we subtracted them in all possible ways to get the integers. Then we divided the integers in all possible ways to get the rationals. Then we split the rationals in all possible ways to get the real numbers. 
The structure and properties of each type of number can be defined in terms of the previous type. In this way, all possible statements about the real numbers, like pi is less than e squared, can be reduced to statements about natural numbers. Mathematical objects and their properties, the things we prove theorems about, are defined in terms of other mathematical objects and their properties. Math is built out of simpler math, hence the pyramid idea. But where does this process of simplification end? In other words, what holds up the bottom of the pyramid? In the late 1800s and early 1900s, this was a real crisis for mathematicians and philosophers. Mathematics has no foundation. Gottlob Frege and Bertrand Russell were very worried about mathematics' seeming lack of a foundation. Along with Richard Dedekind of the aforementioned Dedekind Cuts, they founded and advocated for a philosophical position known as logicism, as in logic plus ism. Basically, logicism says that the bottom of the pyramid of mathematics is logic. Mathematics is founded in logic. Essentially, mathematics is logic. In Russell's words, the goal of logicism is to show that all pure mathematics follows from purely logical premises and uses only concepts definable in logical terms. Just as we reduced all statements about the real numbers to statements about natural numbers, the logicist wants to reduce the natural numbers, and everything else, to logic. This leads to some obvious questions, like what exactly is logic? Logicism is a philosophical position, and the intended meaning of the word logic is fundamentally philosophical and not mathematical. The definition is difficult to pinpoint and different for each logicist. But mathematician Ernst Snapper writes that, generally, the logicist thought that a logical proposition is a proposition which has complete generality and is true in virtue of its form rather than its content. For example, the law of excluded middle. For any proposition p, either p or not p. Logic should feel simple, natural, and never ad hoc. That's what allows it to ground mathematics, to sit at the base of the pyramid. In the late 1800s, Gottlob Frege became the first person to earnestly attempt to carry out the logicist project. He spent years developing an extensive system of logical axioms and notation, a foundational system from which he derived the basic laws of arithmetic. The project seemed to be a logicist success, until Bertrand Russell rather famously ruined it. Just as Frege's book was going to press, Russell pointed out that Frege's system contained a contradiction. Using the basic law 5, one could derive Russell's paradox, the set of all sets that do not contain themselves. Even though Russell witnessed the specific errors in Frege's work, he was inspired by its central goal, to give mathematics a logical foundation. Together with Alfred North Whitehead, Russell continued to push the logicist agenda in their three-volume Principia Mathematica. The work succeeded in reducing large sections of mathematics to an axiomatic system, and famously exhausted the first few hundred pages proving that 1 plus 1 equals 2. But not all the axioms they used were pure logic. This is essentially the same status as mathematics' most well-known axiomatic system, zermelo frankel set theory. From the axioms of ZF set theory, even without the sometimes controversial axiom of choice, one can derive most of classical mathematics. That is, you can reduce most known math to those eight or nine axioms, a logicist success. We now know, thanks to Gödel, that we'll never have an axiom system which produces all of math. It's impossible to prove the ZF axioms will never produce a contradiction, but none have been found so far. Another good sign. Unfortunately, some of the ZF axioms cannot be considered pure logic. For example, the axiom of infinity, which asserts that there exists infinite sets, cannot reasonably be considered an axiom of pure form. It asserts something about content, something more than basic logic. So, as Snapper jokes, since at least two out of the nine axioms of ZF are not logical propositions in the sense of logicism, it is fair to say that this school failed by about 20% in its efforts to give mathematics a firm foundation. Logicism had some successes, and huge portions of modern mathematical logic are the historical or mathematical consequences of the crisis about the foundations of mathematics. We've never really figured out what's at the bottom of the pyramid, but along the way we've discovered a ton of other fascinating mathematics and philosophy. Hello! 
You all had a lot of awesome responses to our episode on pseudo-random numbers, and a lot of your comments had to do with what the nature of randomness is. Where does it come from? And Paradoxically Excellent said, I believe I've heard that the digits of pi pass most statistical randomness tests, and they never repeat, but they are also not random. That's a really interesting point. Maybe they're pseudo-random. They do pass, or we believe that they pass, a lot of tests for randomness. And one of those is that we believe pi is a normal number, which really means it's just digits are distributed very evenly. They're very spread out. All the digits and all the sequences of digits are equally likely. And we talk about that a lot in our episode Combining Pi and E. So check that one out. Pan Raphael asked a great question. Can't humans come up with random numbers? It also really gets at the question, what is randomness? And there were also some awesome responses. So Nathan Rasmussen says that he teaches a class in cryptography, and basically if you ask people to come up with a random number, there's only certain numbers they're gonna come up with. And that's kind of a fun experiment. Maybe any of you who are teachers wanna give it a try. A related version that R.A. Reynolds brought up that I've actually tried in class is that if you ask people to write a sequence of 100 random coin flips. So say, pretend to flip a coin 100 times and write heads, tails, heads, tails, over and over and over again, 100 times. And then you have other people actually flip a coin 100 times and write the sequence out. They look very different. People are afraid to write, let's say, five heads in a row. They think that that doesn't seem random. But if you actually flip a coin 100 times, you, it's pretty good chance that you'll get something like five heads in a row or five tails in a row. It's not that unlikely. And so people write down very different looking random sequences than the actually random ones. And that's a really fun experiment to run in a classroom. And in another comment, Co Phillips linked to a website where you can click the keys F and D randomly, and it will try to guess which one you're gonna click next. And it's pretty good you can see how random you can make your sequence, whether it can interpret any patterns or not. It guessed my next key about 60% of the time, so I couldn't really beat it, but maybe you can. We've linked to the website in the description. It's really fun. Check it out.